coming the people, the slaveholders, the big slaveholders knew the uh, how all, how their how other slaveholders on big plantations were acting. And if you had a bad reputation, such as what Mariko said, you are not only getting a bad relation with your slaves, you're also getting a bad relation with other slave owners. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's another consideration that they would have in mind. Go ahead. Slaves are like cattle. I mean, uh, today, when um, I mean cattle, if, for example, my grandfather has a farm and when a cow gets sick, he, he brings a doctor and gives him medicine to try. Because, well, the cow for him is money, it's just, just a slave. Slaves have to be treated well, they have to be healthy, they have to be strong so that they can produce or whatever they are is said, uh, asked to produce. Good. So you have a bunch of valid reasons. Give me some more evidence or things that stood out to you because there's plenty to comment upon. Amanda. Miners were not allowed to work in the plantation. Miners under 16. Okay, miners under 16, which is telling because now how old are you to oh, be a miner? No. 20. Miners, miners under 16. In the United States, guys, 21 officially you're an adult. At 18, you have certain privileges. 16, you have privileges. 16, you can drive. Well, that's a, there's actually, it varies because there's some cases like farm states where you can drive younger than 16. 18, you can go into the military and buy tobacco products. Um, 21 and 18, you can also vote, you know, which is a, one of the most essential rights if you're in a democracy or a republic. Um, and then 21 in the United States is, um, you know, purchase alcohol and, you know, you're... You cannot be tried as a as a minor anymore. You're you're fish, You're an adult through and through. Yeah. Eighteen in many cases, but twenty one. There's is kind of the last threshold you have to break through because you can't, um, you know, of course, buy alcohol until you're twenty one years of age. David. And the thing that women and children must. Must what? Must wave in the in the plantation. I'm not mistaken. They must do what? We, we, like, we, sorry. Knit. Knit. They're not permitted to do it in the factory, but they must they do it. Must do it okay. Um, what are they going to be knitting? Their clothes. Clothing. Or making men's, you know, really? fixing. Because remember, they're guaranteed clothing. It's right there in the... Go ahead, Cass, if You're going to comment on that? No, no. Yes, that's what I was going to say. That in the they were given nice clothes. They're guaranteed clothing, right? A couple no. outfits a year. And housing. And what can you tell me about the housing? That depending on their family... Like if they had like one or two children or rather like if their family was big they got a bigger house and they could have like a garden outside and everything. Right, depending on the size of their family, but they're all guaranteed housing. And the housing has a chimney, right? A separate room with a fireplace for cooking. They're guaranteed pots and dishes and pans to cook with. Um, they can have a garden. A lot of things are outlined here that are guaranteed, right? That would make life seem normal. Right? Whereas these industrial laborers aren't guaranteed anything except 11 hour workday, which nobody's mentioned yet. It's also, those are the rules, and you can't really. Fargus, can you press the button? Sure. Thanks. I don't know, I just feel like the rules will be different to how the reality actually works. No, this is an excellent point. The rules give us one representation. <laughs> But it's very, it, it can be very different in practice. The rules, even here, look at um, you know, some of the rules we have in school that no one follows. Like, you're supposed to have a pass in the hallway. Well, you know, I'm trying to get better with that, and so are other teachers. But the color of the sweater. Oh, yeah, and like uh, another one, your shoes, color of your pants. Or like Santiago Escobar always comes into class in shorts. And I'm supposed to give him a yellow slip, but he's coming from gym, right? No, or white, no, yellow or red. No, white. Oh, white is for clothing. It shows you I've never actually issued one. Um, okay, good. What other things? There's more you could point out. Yes. The people in the factory can't drink. Yeah, this is an important one. We're going to talk about this in a little detail. Number, it's rule number four. Guys, does anybody have the rules in front of them? No. Number, let's focus on this one. The rule number four, I've got to move my camera and pick up my thing. Can you pick it up? I need it. All right. Can you read it, number four? On this one? Yeah. Uh, no person who drinks intoxicating liquors will knowledgeably be employed by the Lewis and Mills. So no person drinking intoxicated li liquors will what? Be employed. 
knowingly be employed by the Lewiston Mills. Okay, well, knowingly be employed by the Lewiston Mills. Good, thank you. Um, so, is this saying drunk at work or just drinking in general? Drinking in general. Why do you think they would make a rule for drinking in general? Because they can, it can make a drinking problem and that's not good because you can stop working and doing other things. Oh, maybe there's a drinking problem. Okay, go ahead, Arena. You, you want discipline, you, you want them to be focused, you want them to feel they are on the task, you want them to be productive. Good, and it, what is it kind of implying? If they have to make a rule that says you can't drink anywhere and be an employee of this mill, what is it telling us? Go ahead. That they have reasons to drink. That well, people have reasons to drink and that they do. they do drink. Guys, actually, you find this in a lot of... Factories, and I can use my grandfather as a result, as an example, where alcohol, there's a lot of alcohol consumption. You're working in a very drab environment, sometimes 11 hour days, right, in an enclosed room with machines that are very loud, okay, unsanitary conditions, dangerous job, you're stressed, you get out of work, a lot of people cope, we talk about coping mechanisms, they cope by consuming alcohol. My grandfather is a great case of this because when he was 16, he dropped out of high school. He was the oldest male child in a family of nine. And his father basically was at times an absentee father, meaning not present to help take care of the family and provide money. So as the oldest male child, he had to kind of take responsibilities that his father didn't. And he dropped out of school and ended up working in the steel plant and working in the ovens where they would melt the steel, right? And he would shovel coal. And this is very dirty, disgusting, breathing in a lot of gas fumes and, uh, you know, getting like black lung and all these horrible industrial illnesses. He would work the night shift, so he'd go into work about 11 o'clock and finish at 7 a.m., more or less, right? And then him and his friends would go out and consume a lot of alcohol and then come home and some of them would, you know, what you can imagine what they might do, beat their wives, right? Abuse their children, right? It's not funny. Because it's a reality. Um, and even if the factory owner didn't care about that aspect of it, they're not being responsible. They're coming into work hungover. If you're hungover, you're not going to be as productive, productive as if you have a, you know, a clean mind and you're full of energy from a good night's rest. But this was a coping strategy for people to deal with their drab conditions. Also, they also represent the factory, the good name of the factory. You know, this is, a, this is definitely... Um, worth mentioning. You gonna comment on this? No, okay, let's stick to this. Me. Go ahead. No, I okay, I want to stick to this. When we get to prohibition, that you guys are aware of what it is. When the outlaw alcohol. Okay, now we're that's in the 1920s though. Okay, we're dealing now with the late 1800s, mid late 1800s. One of the kind of arguments that the temperance movement makes, and the temperance movement is the movement to, you know, make alcohol consumption legal and the sale of alcohol legal, ties right into these industrial laborers. You know, there's these industrial workers are consuming so much alcohol, it's creating criminality, bastard children, it's breaking up the family, it's a danger to society, it's a danger to our moral fabric, okay? That alcohol, the consumption of alcohol is immoral, and in the cities and factories, it's so common, we actually have to legislate it out to save, you know, our country, to keep our country moral, to keep our country righteous. So it is a real issue, okay? And they try, of course, to pro prohibit it, which is a total failure. What did you want to mention, Daniel? No, I was going to say about that, that later after that, kill up prohibition. Mm-hmm. So people can drink and kill a lot of people. They see alcohol as a cause of many of, this, of social... Maladies they like social diseases, huh? Yeah, yeah, what is it? Well, we talked about that already, right? Yeah, but yeah. that's why they don't let them drink, maybe. Well, sir, I mean, it, people. There's people who are plenty religious that also yeah. consume alcohol, but then there's certain branches of Christianity that don't allow for it, right? And then certainly, if you're a hardcore, like Salafi, you know, Muslim, you're not allowed to drink, not allowed to smoke. Go ahead. You, you also well, they didn't realize long time that the problem was not that much the alcohol they were drinking, but the conditions that made them drink. Yes. Very good. Well, that's, the whole, that's why it's a coping strategy. This is excellent. Right? You're working in a drab environment, 11-hour shifts. You're going to be very stressed out. You're going to need a release. Especially alcohol, guys, is an escape. It's escape from reality. 
right? I mean, you guys are in high school. I hope you're not doing it, but I know that you're around it. We've had discussions about this in the past, and um, it's an issue here at the school. But, you know, it's an escape from reality. It's easier not to deal with your problems by just drinking, but that's not going to solve your problems, right? There's better escapes, like, you know, working out or going to a movie or putting on your headphones, going for a jog, right? But one of the oldest kind of escapes is altering your state of mind, whether through alcohol or other kind of substances. Yeah, well, there's various ones. I mean, even legal drugs, people on antidepressants and so forth, you know, that's altering their brain chemistry. It's like happy pills, right? Nowadays, especially in my country, you know, geez, it's like every other person's on antidepressants. My mom, my grandma, all my aunts. Yeah, my sisters, who are your age just about. And they're already on antidepressants. Yeah. It's a way of dealing with the world, I guess, because they're not, they don't feel like they're capable of dealing with it on their own, which is a sorry situation because that should be one of our goals is to be able to deal with the world without, you know, chemical assistance, let's call it. Okay, good. What else can you point out? Um, they are made to work 11 hour sh shifts, I think. Good, 11-hour shifts in the factory side. How much in the plantation side? 13. Uh, well, they start at 8 and 9 o'clock, it says. Right? That's when they're done. But on both sides, they're also given time allotment for eating, so you can cut out some time. Technically, though, you said 13. 13 hours. They would work longer on the plantation side. 13-hour shifts. Well, not even shifts. Days. Yes. Right. While slaves are just sold. Yes, so slaves are held in property. There's actually a title to them, like a receipt of ownership. No, they don't have to sign it. Like they're not. No, the, they're sla not the slaves don't have to do it. The slaves don't have to do anything, exactly. right? Well, um, uh, in, in regard to the exchange, it's between the it's between the seller and the buyer of the slave. Yeah. Yes, your hours of eating on the factory, they have like from one from eight o'clock and also at one. Okay, it, there's strict hours for them to break. We talked about how your bell schedule here at school goes back to the Industrial Revolution. It's the same thing that you'd find people would line up outside of the factory gates. First bell would ring. Then you have 10 to 15 minutes to get into your room or, or facility of production. Then the second bell rings. You have to start working. A couple hours later, maybe you have a break or maybe you don't. And you have to wait four or five hours for lunch. Bell rings. Half an hour lunch. Bell rings again. Back to the factory. But the way that we organize our day here at school comes directly from these industrial processes and factory, you know, structure. What else? Yep. Like in the, the plantations, they had like everything. Yeah, this is interesting because I have some first-hand experience with this having worked at a boarding school before I worked here where we kind of, I mean, we didn't treat the children like they were property or slaves, but we did the exact same thing which is outlined in these rules at the Bose Plantation as far as surveillance, you right? C-U-R-F-E-W, okay? Why are these people under constant surveillance? Because they're getting escaped. So yes, to stop them from escaping. To stop them from escaping. What else? Rebelling. What's the punishment for an escaped slave? Okay, it could be whipping. What other, what's another punishment? Could be sold. Sold. They could be sold. Their family could be broken up. What's another punishment? The killed? They can be killed or they can be uh, no, not killed because then they lose like. Well, they could be killed. Yeah, but they wouldn't want to do that because then you know it's losing their investment. They'd probably rather sell them to another master, but they would also put a brand an R into their cheek. I think I mentioned this last class. Maybe I didn't. And then for men, the second time in certain areas, they would castrate. So talk about a motivation not to step out of line or a motivation not to try to run away. Um, you know, this is pretty strong motivation, you know. And a lot of what you could see here in the rules, people said they kind of seemed generous. I mean, if you look at the food allotment for the slaves at the Bose Plantation, what do they get? Three and a half pounds of bacon a week, a pound of flour for each male slave that works outside, two and a half for the indoor slaves because they're working less hard, less strenuous work. And they're getting, a, we call it somewhat, you know, adequate. We'll say adequate amount of food. And at their meals, the, remember, the overseer has to inspect their food. Make sure that there's vegetables, Ooh, vegetables. bread, and meat so that it's a balanced meal because it's an, 